Hello, my name's Jack Holden. I'm an actor, writer and producer and I performed at the Leicester Curve in 2017 in a play called What the Butler Saw. Um, but something else I've performed in in my career is Shakespeare and I wanted to give you a little workshop on Shakespeare today to share with you some of the things I've learned about it. Um, at school I used to be quite scared of Shakespeare, I think. Um, I didn't understand it uh, as well as I do now, certainly. And um, a lot of it didn't make sense to me on the page. And actually, um, in my last years of school, I realised that speaking the Shakespeare out loud really helped me to understand what it meant. Um, and it was only years later when I was at drama school that um, I was told that Shakespeare never really intended for his plays to be written down. He expected them to be performed immediately. He would write down people's parts and they'd learn them and then they'd perform them. There was no tradition of writing the plays down and keeping them in big Shakespearean tomes that we have now. It was all about writing them and then performing them quickly. That was how the process worked back then. So the way we study Shakespeare now at school is a lot of the time from a book. That's how it has to be. Um, but what really unlocked it for me was speaking Shakespeare and taking those words from the page and putting them in my mouth and embodying them and finding out what they felt like and how they felt to say. So that's what this workshop's going to be about. It's really going to be about um, speaking Shakespeare and just speaking it boldly and confidently because there's no real big secret to Shakespeare. Once you kind of start speaking it, it all starts to make a bit of sense. You just have to be confident, loud, be a bit silly and use your body. So in order to do this, in order to unlock these Shakespearean words that we're gonna to speak today, I think it's time we have a warm up. So the first thing we're going to need to warm up is our breath. Make sure we're breathing right, because in Shakespeare there's a lot of long sentences, there's a lot of big strange words, and in order to speak confidently and properly, we're going to need to support our voice with breath. So our voice is simply us controlling how the breath leaves the body. And we do that either by our articulators, by the lips, the teeth, the tongue, and we do it with our vocal folds. And those are our vocal cords that are in the voice box here. Um, so to ensure that we get a smooth flow of air through the body, we need to just make sure we're breathing right. And when I say breathing right, I mean not breathing up into our shoulders up here, taking high breaths, taking short, sharp breaths like that. Breathing down into the whole of our abdomen, making sure our lungs expand down into our body. So that involves taking deep breaths through our nose, making sure our shoulders aren't tense, giving them a bit of a roll to make sure they're not tense and taking a deep breath through the nose and out through the mouth. Really follow that breath all the way through to the end. In through the nose and out through the mouth. And on that in breath, make sure that your shoulders don't rise up like mine did a little bit then. Just try and make them make sure they're always completely relaxed and try and make that breath sort of expand the ribs sideways, okay? so. And again, in through the nose, and out through the mouth. If you start to feel dizzy at all because we're playing with our breath a bit, just have a sit down, make sure you don't fall over. Okay, and next on our out breath, what I want us to do is change that sound to an S sound. So that's a okay? It's a very little sound, it's, there's a little bit of air escaping from your mouth, it's almost like uh, you're a balloon and someone's put a little cut in you and you're just Or you're like a football whose air is escaping from it. So in through the nose like normal, and out on an S. Yeah. 
Now, because there's a smaller amount of air coming out this time, that means that you can let that breath go on for longer and longer because it's controlling the amount of air that's leaving your lungs. So let's do that again. There we go, I'm just like a ball deflating, like a balloon deflating. Okay, next I want us to change that S sound to an F sound, so F, 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 okay? In through the nose. Now that sound is like we've made a few more holes in the football or a bigger cut in the balloon and a bit more air is escaping. And that's what's happening. More air is escaping on the F sound. So let's try it again. I can't hold that one for as long as the S. Okay, and the last one I want us to do to make sure we're warming up this breathing is the SH sound, the shh, is as if you're being told off. So for this shh sound, make sure you've got lots of lip rounding, that's like that, shh. That's gonna make that sound really nice and clear. Okay, so in through the nose, and out on a shh, shh. Now that one's quite a short out breath because there's even more air escaping this time. One more time. Very good. And one last time on that shh. And at the very end, I want you to push out, even when you think you've got to the end of your breath, I want you to push out even further on a shh, just to get rid of the last bit of air in our lungs. Okay, so in through the nose. And out on a shh. Just get rid of all of that air, scrub the air from your lungs. Well, I'm feeling very oxygenated now, so that's good. Um, but breathing like this is also very good for meditation. Uh, it also calms us down when we think about our breathing and try and control how long our out-breaths take. So if you're feeling stressed or anxious at the moment, which I know a lot of us are, have a go at this breathing anytime you feel that way, and you might be surprised at how it makes you feel. Okay, next, uh, I think it's time we warm up our body a little bit as well. So um, we're just gonna do some spine rolls. So I'm gonna stand sideways onto you. And what I'm basically gonna do is I'm gonna spine roll down from the top of my body by dropping my head down, my chin hits my chest, and then that just brings the rest of my body down. So my arms are hanging loose. And then I think I'm probably gonna go out of shot here, but I'm basically going down until my fingertips are just scraping the floor and if you can't get down that low don't worry just go as low as you can go don't push yourself down and then once you've uh, reached as far as you can go down with comfort just start to slowly roll back up and pop that head back on top at last and again this isn't fast this is really slow we don't need to get a head rush or anything it's just about slowly easing that back down and then building it back up again, building all of those vertebrae on top of each other. So let's go again. Just dropping that chin to that chest. Down we go. As low as you can, as low as you want to go. We'll give yourself a little shake at the bottom there and then slowly building that spine back up. There we go, and then give yourself a shake. <laughs>
Okay, so our breath and our body are feeling good, are feeling engaged. So now what I'd quite like us to do is do a bit of articulation. So I want you to make sort of a kissing shape with your mouth. And then a big smile. Kissing. Big smile. Kissing. Big smile. And then I want you to make a long face, as long a face as you can. And, and as wide a face as you possibly can. Ha ha, ha Kissing, smiling, tall face, oh, wide face. Ha 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 ha. Good, so that's getting our lips going, and articulation is all about our lips and our teeth and our tongue. And by stretching out that face, we're going to make sure we're ready to speak the following Shakespearean words. Okay, um, now. A warning here, these are very rude words, so just make sure there's nobody who might be offended standing around you, okay? So, thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Okay, so you have a go at that with me. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Now, thou in Shakespearean means you. So this is an insult. This is someone calling someone, well, a toad. They're saying they're like a toad, which is I, I, a pretty, pretty rude insult, I'd say. So, thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Venomous meaning poisonous. You're, you're, you're as ugly as a toad and as poisonous as one. That's a pretty good insult, I'd say. So let's say it again together. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Okay, now what I want you to do is really hit all of those consonants. So there's thou art, that t at the end of art, which means are, thou art, you are, thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous, and venomous. So really hit all of those consonants, and you probably should salivate a bit more because you're using your mouth a lot more. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. And really get behind it. Really, really think of someone you, you don't like that much and think about calling them a toad, okay? So, let's say it together. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. And this time, hit those consonants and say it with all of your anger and rage. Thou art like a toad, ugly and venomous. Very good. Now for something quite different to the toad insult. So here we go. When love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. When love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. Okay, so let's say that again together. When love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. So what that's saying is when love speaks, when, when someone falls in love, when love strikes, the voice of all the gods, that's all the gods, whatever god you pray to, whether they're in heaven or wherever you put them, makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. So all the gods are singing so much in heaven that they're making this beautiful music that makes you drowsy because it's just so beautiful. The harmony of the singing is just perfect. So it's saying that love is just the best thing in the world, basically. When love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. So think about all those vowel sounds in there. There's lots of consonants in there that are very important, but this one's about the vowel sounds. When love, the ah of love, when love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. So I want you to do that for me. So when love, let's say it together, when love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. Oof, all those vowels, so juicy. And that's what it's all about, juicing all those words, juicing the consonants, juicing the vowels, bringing them together, and you have a Shakespeare milkshake. <laughs>
Now, another thing about speaking Shakespeare is about finding that impetus to speak it, is why we're saying what we're saying. What is it that makes the character that we're playing speak? And everyone speaks for a reason. We don't accidentally speak, we do it on purpose. And when we want to speak, we need two things. We need to know what we're gonna say, and we need to have some breath so that we can actually say it. So those things are both called inspiration. An inspiration is a breath, and inspiration is getting an idea, is thinking about something, is having your eureka moment. And they're both called the same thing, which is great. Because when we want to speak, especially when we're acting, we have to have that moment of inspiration. We both have to breathe and we have to know exactly what we're going to say. So to speak with power and energy, we need to have our feet rooted on the floor to gain that energy from the ground. We need to have inspiration wherever that comes from, wherever the inspiration drops into our head to speak. And those forces meet in the middle and then we speak. Energy, inspiration, speech. That's always what makes us speak. Every time I say something here, every new sentence I start is because I have breath and an idea of exactly what I'm gonna say. Energy, inspiration, speech. So if we have to speak some Shakespeare, let's think about that. Let's think about what this person's saying, why they're saying it, and let's get that breath in so that we can say it powerfully. Inspiration, energy, speech. So now we've had a look at the basics of our voice and our articulation, and we've had a look at some Shakespearean words. I want to look at a certain speech with you. It's from a play called A Midsummer Night's Dream, which some of you may be familiar with. It was a play I performed in at the Royal Shakespeare Company um, a few years ago, um, the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, which isn't that far away from Leicester. It's a very silly play, lots of fun things happen in it but it begins with a very, very serious scene in the Athenian court uh, of Theseus and Hippolyta, where Aegeus brings in his daughter Hermia, trying to persuade Theseus, the king, to stop her being allowed to marry Lysander, who, which was my character. Uh, we were actually in love, Lysander and Hermia, but Aegeus wants his daughter Hermia to marry Demetrius, who's another Athenian guy. Um, so this is all being played out in the court, and my character Lysander stays quiet for most of this scene. That doesn't mean he's not involved, he's watching everything, he's watching all the negotiations that are going on. But he loves Hermia so much, so there comes a point where he can't be quiet anymore, and he has to speak. And this is what he says. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius, and, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nida's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. So let's read it through together. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius, and which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nida's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. So there's the speech, and let's break it down and see what it actually means. I am my lord as well derived as he. I am my lord as well derived as he. 
Lysander is talking about Demetrius and he's talking to Theseus. So he's making his case to Theseus as to why he should be with Hermia. I am, my lord, as well derived as he. That means I'm as good a man as him. I come from the same sort of people as him. I'm a good person. As well possessed. That means I am as rich, I am as wealthy as Demetrius, so there's nothing to distinguish us in terms of wealth. My love is more than his. That's the other thing. He genuinely loves Hermia a lot more than Demetrius, so that's quite an important point, I'd say. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius. So I'm as good a man as Demetrius in every single way, if not better than him if not with vantage, like advantage, if not better than Demetrius. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, and, and which is more than all of these things put together, all of these things that are boasts, that don't mean anything. Hermia loves me and I love Hermia. Love, that's the thing that's important here. Do you remember in that thing we were saying earlier? Love. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Why should not I then go after the thing I love? Why shouldn't I stand up for myself and make my case about why I love Hermia and why we should be together? And then Lysander decides to change tactic a bit. He's made his case. He said, he's as good as Demetrius. You know, he's a good man. Everything should be equal in that sense. And then he decides to play a bit dirty and he turns on Demetrius. He reveals a secret about him. Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head made love to Nida's daughter, Helena. So he's already in love with someone else. He's already been with someone else. He's got a girlfriend. It's like, come on, man. And her name is Helena. And won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry. So she's completely in love with him. She dotes on him, she just, can't get enough of him. She's head over heels in love with him. He says that three times to really get the point home. Devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry, idolizes him, makes him an idol. Devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. Remember that toad insult I showed you earlier? Spotted and inconstant man. Now, spotted doesn't necessarily mean he's actually spotty, but it means his character is marked. He's a bit of a, a bit of a shady character. Upon this spotted and inconstant man. So Lysander finishes with an insult, like all good arguments do. So, remember what I was saying about inspiration and energy, and then we can speak? So we know what we're saying now, we've worked out what it all means, and we've warmed up so we can really attack this text, and it makes so much more sense saying it out loud. We've got to imagine that Lysander is just head over heels in love with Hermia, and Hermia's dad is saying, yeah, you can't be together because she needs to be with Demetrius because he's a better man. I mean, We'd all be livid, wouldn't we? We'd all be so angry. So we've got to think about that anger and how that would affect his breathing and how that would affect his interjection at this point in the argument. He just bursts in with this long speech, this argument about why he is worthy of Hermia's love and why all of this is ridiculous. And it's clearly not going his way but because by the end, he throws in an insult, which is, you know, undoes an argument a bit. So let's look at the beginning of that speech. I am my lord as well, derived as he. So there's six monosyllables there, single beat words that he's really hammering his argument home with. I am my lord as well, derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. He uses the word love really early on. And that's the root of his argument. It's not about status, it's not about class, it's not about who's richer, who's better looking. It's about the fact that he loves Hermia and Hermia loves him. And that should count for everything, shouldn't it? And then let's scoot halfway down the speech to, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Beloved, beauteous, those B alliterative words, really making that love burst out. I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. She's beautiful and she loves me. It's great. Why should not I then prosecute my right it's a good question, you know? On paper, 
they're evenly matched. Plus, Hermia actually loves him, so why shouldn't he stand up for himself? It's a good question to ask people. Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, don't worry, I'll say this to his face, because it's the truth, made love to Nida's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. He's already done this, he's already, you know, been in love with someone, he's already got a girlfriend, like, come on, let me have Hermia. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry. So Helena is also in love, she's desperately in love herself with Demetrius. So there's this big love triangle, love square going on, and he's trying to, and Lysander feels like he's the only one who's sane here. He's the only one who can see everything that's going on, and everyone seems to be ignoring it. So underpinning this speech is a real human's desire to, you know, get justice and get his girl. So it's not just abstract Shakespearean words on a page, it's words from someone who really, really wants something. And that's the thing, is we've got to find the objective. What does the character want? in every bit of Shakespeare that they're speaking. What do they want to get? And that'll really unlock it. And of course, there are a few weird words along the way, but if we know what they want, then it really unlocks what they're saying. So if we know in our head that Lysander desperately wants to sort this all out, he wants to get out of here, he wants to be with Hermia, he wants to be allowed to be with Hermia, and for them to be together as they're meant to be. If we take that into the scene, then it's not just a bit of a fusty old Shakespeare speech. It's real and it means something. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his, my fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius, and which is more than all these boasts can be. I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius. I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nida's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. So you can see, as I'm speaking here, I'm making sure that breath is falling in, and I'm using all of those consonants to hit and bounce off and use to win my argument. And when I pull off the argument, it's because I'm thinking about love and all those vowel sounds float out. So I'm hoping this has been a useful introduction into speaking Shakespeare. As I said, I always found it was so helpful when I was studying Shakespeare to just speak a bit of it out loud. Or if I was struggling to understand it, try and just sound it out and see how it sounds. Because there's a music to Shakespeare, a rhythm to it, that might help you unlock the deeper meaning and what that character wants. Always go back to that, always go back to what the character wants to get out of speaking. Because we all speak with a purpose, don't we? We all speak to communicate a story, or to argue something, or to make a point, or to call for help, or to tell someone we love them, or to tell someone we hate them, to call someone an ugly toad. Whenever we speak, it's with a purpose, an objective. So always think about that and apply that to Shakespeare. Thank you for watching this curved classroom lesson. Stay safe and hope to see you at the theatre again one day.